Nile, uh, you grew up in Illinois on a farm with six brothers. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, My mother. What's that about your mother? She had, she had, she had all the work. <laughs> Raising seven boys, I guess so. And uh, what was it about the Army Air Corps that attracted you? Okay. Uh, Jackson bomb Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be list. I considered Army first. And at that time, the Army was doing a lot of walking. I don't know about now. So that's how. <laughs> then I considered Navy. Well, the ship might sink. So I said, well, I guess I'll go in the Air Force. And what happened? I got shot down by a German night fighter. <laughs> and, and that was not what he expected, because his job wasn't normally to fly. So Niall was a, an aircraft mechanic on B-17s with the 96 Bomb Group out of Snetterton, England. On April 12, 1944, he volunteered for a mission, but it was a pretty short mission, right? How far were you guys supposed to go? Well, we just going to the other base because our plane was going to be a lead plane. That's when they, they took him ball turret out of the bottom and put a radar dome in there and then they could bomb through the clouds or anything. They were all the lead plane too and we get shot down. And that radar dome you're talking about, I mean this is secret technology at the time and, and because they had a Pathfinder plane all the planes following them could bomb the target too even in bad weather. How much did one of those radar domes weigh? Oh, three or four hundred pounds anyway. Yeah, remember that detail. So, so you're going to go. You don't normally fly, but you're going just from one base in England to another. I volunteered, but it, never volunteer again. Anybody ever here? You're never supposed to volunteer for anything in the military. So, so tell us what happened. You're getting close to that other base, and and that's Framlingham, England. And and what happened? Okay, uh, we were on the final approach, and there were. The base knew that enemy aircraft were in the vicinity. They called them uh, these other planes, other planes, uh, um, intruders. Mm -hmm. And they, he followed us right around the pattern. The pilot said, because of uh, it was a night mission, we didn't have any lights on the plane at all. But as soon as he called for the runway lights to be on, that's when he got us because he follows around the pattern. He shot out three and number three and number four engines. He set it on fire and part of the controls. And those two pilots up there were doing everything they could and so we didn't cartwheel. We were going to cartwheel at, at first, but then the, the left wing came down on a row of trees and that straightened us out and we hit the ground and bounced and bounced and we went across a ditch, uh, through a wall, across a road, through another ditch, another wall, and a tree stopped us. How many is amazed just by that? And you haven't heard the rest of the story yet. And by the way, that, that wall they crashed through was on the estate of the Earl of Cranbrook in England. That was the fourth Earl of Cranbrook. His son, who is now the fifth Earl of Cranbrook, was 11 years old at the time and woke up that morning to this wreckage on his estate. And he knows about Nile and would like to have him come visit if uh, that becomes possible. But, so this story wasn't done yet. And, and tell us what you were doing in the plane when you realized that you guys were probably going down because this German fighter had shot you down? Well, I was looking for a safe place to go. Um, all the air crew had put the flying gear in the back of the plane there, and I burned my way down to the bottom of it because that Mickey or a dome came out of there, went right over the top of me, and landed on another guy and broke his leg. But that's what saved me. And what did the plane look like when it finally came to a stop? Well, number three and number four was on fire, part of the controls, and it was, I knew it would blow up. Uh, we got everybody, well, we couldn't find the radio man, the navigator, we found him in a wheel well, up behind number two engine. There was, four guys that went through the top, through the roof. 
The pilot was laid, lying out on the ground. He had a broken left arm and leg and fractured skull. The co-pilot, when he came to, he had a bump on his head, but he was hanging in a tree. <laughs> so we just unbuckled all his harness and came down. Uh, there was another ground man out at the back. Uh, I don't know how I did it, but he, I dragged him about 100 feet, you know, just like you'd take a piece of paper and take it back there, you know. And uh, by that time, there was, well, a couple of other guys up. But like I said, we couldn't find the radio man, but um, we all got behind the wall that was there, and then it blew up. I knew it blew up. And everything went up in the air, the gasoline. I think we had about 2,000 gallons of 100 octane in it and uh, four smoke bombs and I don't know how much ammunition, 50 caliber ammunition, but uh, everything blew up and went up in the air about 100 feet or so. And I thought it was going to fall on us again. So I got up and started to run, but I burned out before it got to us. Does this sound like a nightmare to anybody else or just me? I mean, holy moly. And I'm, we mentioned that radar dome. You said it weighed 400 pounds maybe, maybe even yeah. more. And it was on top of a guy trapping him. So yeah. what did you guys do? We picked it up and laid it to one side and took him out. <laughs> Two of you guys picked yeah. up something that weighed 400 pounds. Yeah. yeah. How does that work? Well, I don't know. It just worked. It, it, um, they said you have superhuman strength or whatever it is. But uh, that's how it was. And what happened afterwards is the government gave them that soldier's medal I just showed you. And as far as we could tell, they didn't want to admit that a German plane had come over the channel into England and shot them down. So they gave them a medal. A soldier's medal is for action not in combat against the enemy. Uh, it's a very rare medal. It's a prestigious medal. But that sure sounds like combat against the enemy to, to me, it's don't in, you think? It's in McCart, if you were... were yeah, I, he's got some pictures of what that plane looked like after the explosion. Um, now, one thing, this is me talking, not Nile. I think he deserves a different medal. And there are people who did comparable things who were given the Silver Star or the Distinguished Service Cross or even the Medal of Honor for what Nile did that day. And I'd love to see that happen before his 100th birthday next November. But, Nile, right now, um, I have to ask you, were you scared? Were you frightened? How did you do everything you did? And, and how are you still well, standing here or sitting here today? When that, when that happens, you're not scared. Not really. You know what's going to happen. You tell yourself, well, I guess this is it. And by that time, well, the bombardier was back in the waist. And he said, and he said what the H is going on? And the big part of the bullet hit him, and he just keeled over. Mm. I got the little part, which is in my hip. A doctor asked me uh, several years ago, he said, you, you ever been shot? And I to told him what happened. And he said, does it bother you? I said, no. Well, we'll just leave it there. So I've still got a piece of it back there. But let me ask you, be honest with me. When you look at those pictures that I have here, and I can pass them around. You guys can look at them if you want. Um, is it hard to believe you lived through that? Do you, do you feel like somebody was pulling some strings and looking out for you there, or what? Yeah. And, and that's not all. When, well, first, everybody else on that plane, and there was 11, well, 10, 10 man crew, and the other two were ground men. Uh, they all can't, got to come back to the States. Mm -hmm. I didn't. So I got to thinking about that. And I went down and saw the flight surgeon. I gave him a sad story and everything. And of course, he had my records in front of him. He says, There's nothing wrong with you going back to work. So I went back to work. And that turned out to be a good thing. Because I know I'm just going to fast forward a little bit because I want to save time for Sam and Smokey, too. But you told me you would go into London when you had a pass. And then he almost got killed by a buzz bomb that knocked him against a wall. And then uh, so you decided to start going to Scotland. And that led to a pretty significant development, right, in Edinburgh? Yeah. What was that? Well, I went up to, I decided I wasn't going to London anymore. So I went because of the... The rocket, see? 
And uh, I met my wife in dance hall in Edinburgh. All right. <laughs> Three and four months, we got married. We were married about 70, 72 or three years. She just passed away about three years ago. So that was that. Yep. So it's a good thing you didn't get to come home. There's a, there's a daughter and grandkids and great-grandkids because of that. Yeah. Niall, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Is there anything else you want to say? They're giving you an applause here. I'm not there. Okay. He's good for now. You can talk to him later, and I'll bring those, those photos around. All right, so we have, and I, I told you these guys came close to making that ultimate sacrifice. Niall just illustrated that, and Sam will too. So, Sam, uh, you grew up here in the valley in yes. Madeira, yes. right? Yes. Work in the fields, right? Until the age of 17. Uh -huh. Then we moved to prison. My dad got a job on the Amos Street where they, where they manufacture, they produce uh, uh, irrigation pipes for mm -hmm. the farmers. So we had to move to Fresno. Yes, and then I got a job with a Swift company, a chicken, chicken cleaning, <laughs> cleaning the cages. Cleaning chicken cages, and then Uncle Sam said, I've got another job for you? Uh, yes, a better job, yes. Yeah? They, I got conscripted in December the 15th, 1950. So you guys know what was happening in 1950, the Korean War. So you end up in the 3rd Infantry Division, 15th yes. Regiment. That's um, I know there's a lot of other things you went through. Um, but why don't you explain to us what happened the day that you got captured? Okay, we were uh, we were sent to the were a patrol observation patrol, and we went to a point in the hill, and then we saw an enemy across the river, across the river, and then we came back one more time, and the second time is when we got ambushed because the enemy had moved the lights forward. Yes. We were, so no one told you the lines had moved? We, we weren't informed that that line had moved. So when we went to the same draw again, we got ambushed. We got crossfire. We got crossfire. Yes. And there were guys with you who were, yes. were killed in that action? It was, it was a, a total of six boys who were furnished alive. Mm. Yeah, they lost their life. How close did you come? Well, I came close. Uh, the enemy put a a rifle, a rifle in my head, and he said, who, 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 to get up and start moving. And then we, we, we were marched northward mm -hmm. from then on. Had you ever considered the possibility that you could become a prisoner? No. No, we didn't, we didn't come, I didn't come across that thought. No, I didn't come across that thought. Why don't you tell everyone how long you were in captivity? <clears throat> Minus 12 days. Two years. Two years minus 12 days. Can anybody else imagine what that's like? How uncertain that must be? Never knowing when freedom's gonna, freedom is going to come back to you? Yeah. And what did your family know, Sam? Well, they didn't know I was missing in action, or killed in action, until December when my brother saw. My brother saw the, the news, when the, they gave the list of the prisoners, and then that's when they found out that I was still alive. So your family thought you were dead? Yes, my mother and my father thought they were dead. Until your brother's watching TV and a list of names is scrolling through and he sees his brother's name on TV and that's the only reason they knew you were alive? That's right, that's correct, that's right. Again, can you guys imagine this? Wow. And But that was December of 51? 51. And you still had some time in captivity? Yes, yes. All of 52 and part of 53. Only after the pharmacy. Until the armistice, up to the time of the armistice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you were held not by the North Koreans, but by the Chinese, by right? Chinese, yes. How did they treat you? Well, the Chinese had a, uh, I call it a propaganda policy of, they call it humanitarian treatment, because they compared that to what the Koreans had done. So they kind of uh, favored us more, that is, that way. You know, they were. We were treated, we were treated, uh, we were kept busy in the camp, cleaning the snow and bringing the supplies for the, to the camp that we brought. How cold did it get? Oh, I would say about maybe 40 degrees below zero. 40 degrees below zero. It's yeah. a lot colder than the valley. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Did you have frozen toes, frozen fingers, anything no, like that? No, no, they gave us uniforms. 
They were very short. Their slings are very short. You could touch your skin and just barely feel, feel a little bit feeling. Your your hands would go numb. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And you had a nice Pardini's lunch today, but I don't think the Chinese were serving Pardini's. What, what did they feed you? <clears throat> Excuse me. In the first three months, we ate turnips morning, morning and night, because they didn't have no lunch then. We had morning and the night and the evening, we had turnips. Turnips, three months, January, December, January, and February, and part of March. And later on, they brought some, uh, some food supplies from uh, China. So, so we were, they changed the menu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody else ever eaten nothing but turnips for three months straight? Anybody ever eaten a turnip period? <laughs> so, what's, so give us a, a tip, Sam. What's your favorite way to prepare turnips? <laughs> uh, yes, three, three times a day, it's all right. <laughs> Well, and I have to ask you, I mean, nearly two years in captivity, not having proper nutrition, uh, being cold, having to work, how much weight did you lose? I lost about 46 pounds after from the beginning to the end of the, mm -hmm. the stay, yes. And maybe this sounds like a, a cliched question, but I, I'm sure it's one that everybody is asking in their head right now. For all of that time, day after day after day for almost two years, not knowing if you'd ever see your family again, if you'd ever make it back to America again, what was it that, that kept you hopeful? What was it that kept you going? Well, we were, we were taught to have faith in God and also to be, be active in, you know, when you have time, be active, in, do sports or something, you know. And, uh, well, I just had hopes. I just had hopes. I had faith that, our country was to come and help us, come and save us. So I can't wrap up, and if there's anything important to you, feel free to share it, but I have to ask you about that moment where you got to taste freedom again after oh, yeah. not experiencing it for almost two years. What was that liberation like? Oh, very, very happy. Very, very happy. Yes, we're glad to be back. Yes, yes. Do you remember seeing your family again? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I came over. I came over to uh, the field over in near uh, Antioch, near Sacramento. That I think they call it Hammer, Hammer Field. No, uh, Hamilton Field, I think it is. And when they when I came back, they, they brought us in the stretcher. They brought me in the stretcher mm -hmm. because I contracted TB. I contracted TB is that what you said? Mm -hmm. On top of all that, you know, the the freezing cold, the malnutrition, tuberculosis too. Yes. So you came home on a stretcher. On a stretcher, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. But I bet you can remember the look on your family's faces. Oh, yes, very well. I have a picture of my mother and my dad when they were crying when I came back, when they received me in the airport. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Sam, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I know it's probably not easy to talk about all the time, but it sure helps us understand the price that's been paid for our freedom. Is there anything else you think all these folks need to know about what you went through? Well, I just, I just... I want to invite everybody to don't forget to vote, to exercise your vote, because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we came to fight for, our freedom to choose our leaders instead of having a dictator like they had over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you guys all hear that? Yeah. What they fought for was your right to vote, so you wouldn't have a dictator like they had there in China when he was a prisoner. Sam, Sam thanks so much. Let's give him a hand. So you're getting quite a cross-section of history here. We've got World War II, Korea, and now we move to the Vietnam era. So, Smokey, uh, you're wearing your Purple Heart there on, on your lapel. So uh, all three of these guys have been through incredible things and came really close. Any other decorations that you, you rarely tell everybody that you received? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you're, you just did a job and you got, you got what you, you know, you got what they gave you. I got a distinguished flying cross. Uh, Purple Heart was pinning, but the paperwork was blown up in the in the in the headquarters building that when they were doing it, so they still say it's pending. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Only 50 years later, you know. Yeah. So uh, that, and then I one of the ones I'm really, uh, I mean, I'm proud of is uh, the Vietnamese cross of gallantry with a silver star, that was given to me by uh, Vice uh, President uh, Tu at that time. He came to the hospital, 
and he uh, and he and he pinned it on me. And uh, uh, you know, I mean, you got the other ones, you know, but uh, you know, there's just certain ones that really really means a lot to you. And but I think the main thing is uh, I've never, you know, it's it's kind of a lot, and I think a lot of you out there understand. Any of them that your people, that your your commanders, your other officers, or enlisted, whatever, wrote you up for and said you deserved it, those was was special. Not the ones that you had to write up or whatever. I never, I never in my life wrote one when they said, "Well, smoke, write it down and write." I no. I said, if you don't have the time and I didn't do what I was supposed to do, then then I don't need one. So I think that was probably one of the the best things. I think, you know, is one of those I didn't have to write. It was just there. And I just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and we're going to hear about that. I should mention, too, I mentioned Niall grew up on a farm in Illinois. Sam's from Madera. Smokey's from a little further past that in the great city of Chowchilla. And he's got some memories there, too. But you just said uh, they gave it to you in the hospital. So I'll hand you the mic for a minute. Why don't you tell us how you ended up in the hospital? Because I think that's a pretty involved story. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things. Uh, my wife really didn't know about it for about a year after it happened. And um, I, was a, I was a fighter pilot and a forward air controller, so I had 15 missions out the USS Kitty Hawk. Uh, it, I was in the Air Force. I was Air Force for 25 years. But when I first started off, uh, I was a fighter pilot in Vietnam, flew F-4s and OV-10s, which was a... Uh, forward air controllers, and for, for a lot of you know what fax is, forward air controllers, you go out there, 100 killer type thing, you work with the people on the ground, the, the, the Green Beret, the Army, the Marines, uh, whomever you're working there, and, if, and you put in airstrikes. We controlled airstrike power in, in uh, <clears throat> some place we weren't supposed to be, like Laos, Cambodia, and also in South Vietnam. Uh, there was some that we put in North of, north of the DMZ, but we weren't there either, right? So, uh, but anyway, working with with them, and we became very, very close, very, very close with the people on the ground. I mean, we only only knew a lot of them, like uh, you know, maybe you know, uh, you know, Juliet Delta, or you know, whatever by by call signs like that. I was Cubby five six six, and that was pretty static, and um, so. We were down, and I was in the Delta area working out of Saigon at that particular time. I had worked all over the place, and I, they sent me down to work in the Saigon area, and I was working down the Delta. I had come back, put in missions, about four hours' worth, and put in several several um, airstrikes. And I came back, and I was also the, uh, the scheduler for our outfit, the 20th, Air, 20th Tactical Air Support Squadron. At, at Saigon, and I put my stuff in, and I was getting ready to go, and I checked on my desk because I was a head scheduler, and all of a sudden I heard code one, code one on the radio, and one of the outposts, Army outposts down in the Delta area, um, was being overrun, and it was Army, and also Arvin, which is the Army Republic of Vietnam. They were down there, and they were being overrun, and they were calling for help. And so we had two ex we had two airplanes all the time ready to go, but fully armed. We carried our own either bombs or we carried our own uh, rockets. We carried our own machine guns, you know, guns on the on the airplane. So I called the commander and I said, "Commander, we've got a problem." I said, he said, "What smoke?" And he says, "I said we're getting a code one for down uh, down at uh, the the outpost." And I told him was what it was. It was again, you know, like Juliet Bravo or whatever. And he says, okay, I said, I'm going to take it, I'm going to go. He says, Smokey, you just got back, Are you, can you do it? And I said, yeah, we got to. I'll take off and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what happens. So I took off down there, ran out there and got in the airplane, and it was already running for me because it was my sergeant who, I tell you what, you know, like I did my granddad and my granddad and my dad who were Army, uh, Army in World War One, and my dad was Army Air Corps World War Two. They said, "Boy, you get yourself a sergeant, and you stick with that individual, and you love them to death because they're the ones going to protect you." So, and, and that's what happened. This the sergeant and I just loved each other. He, I, I had full faith and trust in him. He had my airplane running, had the pins pulled. I got in. He got out. It was a tandem seat. He was in the back. I got in the front. I got out, and I took off. I went down. Down, down. It was about 200 miles down, uh, down Delta area, 
And I get there, and man, and they were and the outpost, which was great the way it was laid out, because it was like maybe 50 yards, 75 yards, and they had triple uh, wire, Constantina wire, all around, in a kind of a triangular area. So it would be hard for the uh, the bad guys to get in and over and stuff like that. And they were just, it was just saturated. It looked like a bunch of ants. And uh, they had, using their ladders and stuff like that, trying to get over or get under the concertina wire. And I just told, told them, I said, keep your head down. And I said, let me work. And so I took off. I armed up with rockets and my machine guns, and I went down. I bet I was about 50 feet off the ground. And, um, and all I did was, was going fairly slow. I could go really fast or I could go really slow. And so I went slow and I just hit my rudders back and forth just to go to, to change. I'd get up and I'd do a little woofer deal going back the other way because it's triangular. And I went there and I did about two, you know, two times around and um, nobody, I, I didn't see anybody moving at that particular time. So I, I got back out of the way, and at that particular time, I called the Navy. I called, actually, the Airborne Command Post. I said, send me Snake and Nape. There's a hamlet, and there nobody should be there unless it's a bad because We went in there ahead of time about two weeks and gave out pamphlets, and we had the um, helicopters that were announced going there and let them know if you're not out of there within two weeks, you're going to be a sympathizer or you're going to be part of them. And so get out of that, that, that hamlet. So anyway, I was waiting, and I was doing, I did a super thing. I was low, and I was slow at that particular time, and I was waiting. And all of a sudden, which we, we didn't know from our uh, intel uh, briefings, the false tree line fell down. And all of a sudden, here it comes a quad-mounted 51 cal. Anything with fast-forwarding, pilots hate it because you can't maneuver fast enough a lot. So anyway, the tree line fell down, and all of a sudden, they were also quite mounted. We didn't know about that, and they started using arming piercing rounds. So in other words, you could, when they hit something, it would wait and blow up inside. And so the next thing I know, I'm, they're, they're just hosing me, and I'm trying to go, they call it jinking. I tried to go to the right, and then I went back to the left. I'd go up, I'd go down, and then all of a sudden, when I turned right again, you could start hearing it starting from my tail and just started coming you hear it hit me hitting hitting the airplane and I tried again and all of a sudden as I turned all of a sudden my head was turned and all of a sudden a bright flash came in came into my cockpit and blew the whole cockpit out I didn't have a cockpit it was gone and all of a sudden I went blind I couldn't see and all of a sudden I th you know all of a sudden I couldn't see I couldn't see my anything all of that air and everything was in my in my face and they kept hitting me. You could hear it, and they were hitting me. And I remembered, I remembered in my mind, the only way I can get out of this, I can't outrun them, and the only way I can do it is I got to get behind them because they had a tree line behind them. So I remember to this day, I remembered me turning upside down, and I couldn't see, but I just turned it upside down, and I fell to the ground. As I fell to the ground, I shot some rockets, and I also shot uh, some... Uh, Ammunition. I mean, Mike, Mike, Adam, to just keep their heads down, and all of a sudden, I didn't know how clo close I was to the ground or whatever. All of a sudden, it started getting dark, and um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, I uh, I said, "Okay, it's got to be dark. I got to be close to the ground." So I flipped it back over, and I took off. And as I started going up, I hit the trees. And I thought, oh, no. And I knew one of my engine was gone. It was on fire. I knew my gear had dropped down. I didn't have, you know, I, I, it was just, it, and the, no cockpit. It was just like being in a wide open cockpit. And I had enough momentum to get me going forward so they couldn't turn the airplane back, I mean, turn the guns around and hit me from the rear. And I remember climbing up there, and I couldn't see. You could hear everything was going on. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, you just knew. And then all of a sudden, you didn't want to think about what was dripping. You just think it was just, uh, you would just say, hey, it's just sweat. It just, that's all it was. It's just sweat. And, and you knew what was happening. And then I, I started climbing back up, and I started hollering May Day. And two of the, the buddies, they were in other areas. They come jumping on my, on my wing. And they said, Smoke, you got to jump. you got to bail out. I said, I'm not bailing out because I just got through doing what I did, and we're not, I'm not going to make it to the ground, and I'm, 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 we're not going to be breaking bread together. So I just said, hey, I'm just going to ride it home, and if I can't get home, then so be it. And they said, what can we do? I said, I can't see. 
And they said, what? I said, I can't see. I said, you just got to tell me a couple of things. If I start dropping my nose down, you start keep talking to me because you know, I could pass out, whatever the case may be. All I'm asking you is just keep talking to me. And when, it, when, when I start dropping down, you can bring me back. I mean, let me know. I'll bring it back up. And I said, the other thing, too, when you see my my flames coming back up again because we had wet wings. In other words, the, air, the fuel was in the wings, too. I said, you just let me know, and I'll dive it, and I'll blow them out. I'll blow the flames out, and then I'll try to come back up again. So we did that 200 miles back, and uh, then, then, then I get back to Saigon at that particular time, and I, I remember in my mind, they said, okay, you've got to switch over. And I remember what channel was on. So I was clicking, counting what numbers I was to get on the right channel. And everybody laughed at me now because what happened, every time I always vary the same thing over and over, but I couldn't see. And if I let myself start wondering, and if I let my thoughts start wondering, I wouldn't know if I'm up or down or whatever, and I would crash. But I said, if I did everything the way I was supposed to do it and everything that I'm used to do it, I said, you can fly the airplane, just just. Just keep your head to yourself. I mean, just keep it. So anyway, they got me on. I told them, I said, I need a GCA. I mean, I need a gyro GCA because I can't see. And that's where they say, start turn, stop turn, begin descent. You're on. And all of a sudden, as I was going down, I got over the runway. And they said, Covey, you're over the runway. God bless you. Good luck. And all of a sudden, I remember the helicopter was above. I could hear it. And it had. So if I hit and it started went in fire, they dropped a halon. And as I came down, I said, I don't know about my gear. I don't know about my gear, you know. So I, I, as I landed, I hit one side, and I said, okay, that was good. So I jumped over here and hit that one, and I said, that one's good. So, But I don't know about my front one. So anyways, I hit, I, I dropped it down, and I pulled it back. And I remember something blurry on the side. It was my roommate. He was in a, heli he was in a Jeep. He said he was trying to get to me. So anyway, I stopped it, and all of a sudden he comes running out there, and and then at, at insult to injury, we had a sniper that was trying to get it, and we kept hitting it, and it kept hitting the airplane. But luckily, I don't know, he was a bad shot, but uh, <laughs> but but he got me out. But the hell, I mean the uh, the uh, the ambulance couldn't get down there because they wouldn't get down because of the the. the um, um, the sniper, so he helped me get out, put me in, in the Jeep. We turned around, took off, and we met the ambulance down there, and um, um, I, was in, I was taken to the hospital. So God was with me. It, it had to be. Amen. Has anybody else ever met a pilot who landed his plane blind and injured? I mean, you just said... God was with you, and, and that was pretty obvious, really, in all three of their stories, right? I mean, we don't hear this stuff every day. I don't know about you guys. It sure gives me a different perspective on what we do on a daily basis and the things we can take for granted. But when you say that, God was with you, uh, was that a thought that was real to you at the time or something that you kind of figured out later? No, it was... It was um... It had always been, you know, I grew up that way and stuff like that. Matter of fact, I, I remember uh, when I got over there, um, you know, you never realize when you go over there, and I think all of us who's ever been in the combat, you don't know because that's not the way we were brought up. When we get over there, and all of a sudden you start seeing what was happening. Boy, it's a rude awakening. And you start looking at it. And I remember the first, very, very first time I went out on a mission, and you knew what you did. You knew that... You just took somebody else's life or a bunch of people's life. And I remember that first time coming home, I was crying like a baby. You know, and uh, I had to get forgiveness. I had to see the chaplain. Mm -hmm. I had to get the okay from my wife. I had the okay from my mom and dad. That I wasn't a bad person. That's what's hard. And then after you lose your first roommate, that really kind of brings it home to you. But then when you lose five of them, I lost five roommates. The fifth one came, sixth one came back as a POW and, my, and myself. And <laughs> like they said, when I got out of the hospital, they said, Smoke, you're able to go home. I said, No, I'm not going home. I said, I got, I, I got, my, I got my tour to do, and I'm going to do it. And so that's the reason uh, my wife didn't know I was 
she was here in Clovis and with two children. I hadn't seen my son. He was born. I hadn't seen him. But I said, no, I'm not. I'm, a stay, I'm staying here and doing my tour because a lot of other people has died, and I haven't, I haven't done mine. So anyway, um, did she know a little bit was when we went to R&R &R and then my roommate, when we went there and we started talking one night and he started getting carried away and he started talking about me when I got shot, what was being said, what was being, because they had taped it. And she looked at me and she says, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, I'll talk to you later about it. <laughs> and so, but that's how she first heard about it, but we really didn't get a chance to talk about it for, for about six, seven, eight months after, until I got home. Mm. And one more question for you, Smokey, and, and thank you again to all you guys for sharing this. I mean, it's, it's so eye-opening for the rest of us. You know, we were talking about honor flight earlier, and I mentioned that, that we take World War II and Korean War and Vietnam veterans and guys who served in between those wars. And we have right now close to 600 Vietnam veterans who are on the waiting list waiting to go. And one of the reasons we've understood it's, it's as important for that generation, maybe more important for that generation as the others, is what people like Smokey endured when they came back. And I remember you telling me a story about that that, that really hit home. Uh, you were afraid to, to wear your uniform at your front door, I think. Is that what the story was? Well, where we came back, and most Vietnam veterans here, and I'm sure that you'd say the same thing, we, we landed, and I landed at Travis. Yep. And we got out, and we get ready to go in, and they said, remember, go in and change your clothes to civilian. Don't go out. And, and and your uniforms or anything like that. And I started in there, and of course I saw my, my wife and daughter and my grand or my son and my mom and dad. And I said, I'm gonna go to change. Well at that time I was in I, I was wearing a flight suit home. And I started to go in and I said, You know something? I'm not going to change my uniform. I just fought for this. A bunch of guys, people died for that. So I went in and put my blues on. And I came out and they said, are you going to change? I said, I did change. I said, I'm wearing my blues. I'm proud of it. You know, so I got my, my we saw, saw the kids. And then my, my wife and I, we went to San Francisco, my kid, my mother, and then they left. And we spent that, we spent that night as we started to go into the hotel. Boy, there was a lot of, lot of stuff that was said about me wearing a uniform in the military. And I remember dropping my wife's hand and I turned around because I was so mad and she says it's not worth it and I said you're right and so I grabbed her hand we walked back in but it was really terrible but I, as we talked that night there was something that really still bothers me to this day and she's able to let it go you didn't realize how how your wives were being treated back here and she told me that and I, I you know I hate to say it we live here in Clovis and I still love Clovis she was from Clovis, I was from Chachilla, but we made Clovis when we first, when I was still going, I was married, had a child playing ball at Fresno State, and I got drafted, but I was able to get into the Air Force. But there was, when I was gone, she, her and my daughter, who was at that time two years old, she got a knock at the front door. And there's my they didn't know, so they went and opened the door, and there was some people there saying, do you know that your husband's over there killing Mamie and raping children over there? And my, my little girl looked at Becky and says, is that what Daddy's doing? And she says, no, and she slammed the door. She came back, you know, about a couple of weeks later, something like they came home one night, and what wound up happening, there was something in red that was written on the door. And so she and uh, my daughter moved in another place uh, here in Clovis. And I hate to use Clovis, but it could have been anybody, you know, Fresno or whatever, but it just happened to be Clovis. You know, at that particular time, there was things that was going on, but like her and I both said, we had we moved on many, many, many years, but we always came back to make Clovis our home. And so you have those type of foolish people that's in any community. You just overlook it and just try to make the best of what it is and try to make your community better. So those are the things that, you know, you think about what happened to military people, but your wife is in the military too or your spouse is in the military too, but they might not be wearing a uniform, but they're supporting stuff like that. And for them to be treated who they're not doing anything, that's kind of, that's kind of a shame. And I still remember that to this day. 
So that's one of the wrongs that we have a chance to right in some small fashion with Honor Flight when we take these guys back. And if any of you have been to our homecomings, you know what that's like. And, uh, and maybe we can mimic that here as we welcome these guys back to their seats. Niall Smith, Sam Banuelos, and Smokey Rickard, thank you all for sharing those memories with us.